seven fragments, seven awakeners, one great power. This is the story of the Divine Knights. Long ago, before the Great Collapse, two clans resided in the ancient land of Erebos, the Kin of Earth and the Kin of Fire. Each group also had under their jurisdiction two Septarians granted by the goddess Adios, treasures that were meant to bring untold prosperity to the ancient civilization. These were the Arc Rouge, the Septarian of Fire, and Los Zem, the Septarian of Earth. For a time, the two clans existed somewhat harmoniously, and the pair of Septarian granted boons to their charges, bringing forth comfort and tranquility for a time. However, human nature dictates that they will always want for more, and this lingering darkness eventually boiled to the surface. In a bid to gain supremacy over the other, the two clans waged war upon each other, and the Septarians manifested into titans of immeasurable height and strength to do battle. Over the next 1000 days, the land was ravaged and torn apart by the clash of earth and fire, and though the clans realised they had made a mistake and sought to end the fighting for the salvation of humanity, the clash of the elements could no longer be stopped. On the 1000th day, the two Septarians prepared themselves for one final bout, expending all their power in a single blow. The resulting melee ended with the two vessels thrown to the farthest reaches of Erebos, motionless even to this day. Thus was lost, the Arc Rouge and lost Zem. However, to say that they disappeared was inaccurate. Instead, something else happened that defied even the design of the goddess who bestowed them originally. What lay in front of the clans was not fire or earth, but rather a new entity, a fusion of primal elements. It was known as the Great One, the Septarian of Steel. And great it was, for it was seen as the ultimate power. But despite that, it housed something that neither clan could hope to control, an endless conflict that had the potential of growing indefinitely. Thus, it was deemed too dangerous to wield, and the two clans, along with the holy beasts of fire and earth, sought to seal it away. After many failed attempts, the groups decided that the only way to contain steel was to split its physical form into fragments, while leaving it whole on a higher plane. With their combined expertise, the kin of fire were able to split the physical incarnation into seven fragments. While the Kin of Earth constructed workshops over areas of highly stimulated septian veins to encourage formation of Zemurian ore clusters, this material would be moulded into the vessel to house the fragments. When all was done, the Septarian of Steel had been successfully split, and humanity could once again breathe easy. In its place were seven doll-like structures, each containing a part of the original's power, with frames of Ashen, Azure, Palatinate, Auric, Argent, Vermilion, and Ebon, this was the birth of the legendary Divine Knights. With the Great Power sealed, Heimdall was eventually founded with the assistance of the Kins of Earth and Fire, who had since renamed themselves to the Gnomes and Hexen clan respectively. The peoples even established a monarchy, naming adjudicator Arnor as the first emperor of the newly formed Erebonia, and for nearly 300 years the land prospered. However, as was foretold in the ancient scriptures held by the Arnor family, a terrible calamity befell the capital of Heimdall in 271 of the Septian calendar. Bellows of rage sounded above the capital as the dark dragon Zora Ugruga laid waste to the city, its miasma spreading throughout the populace creating a necropolis of the dead. All was not lost though, as the Hexen clan and gnomes along with Emperor Astorius II were able to evacuate a fair proportion of the populace to the city of St. Ark, which would become the capital of Erebonia for 100 years. Unfortunately though, this did not come without a cost. The gnomes lost the Holy Beast of Earth, which absorbed a majority of the curse into itself before sealing itself away below Karal Imperial Villa, and the Hexen clan's elder also lost their life. It was only 100 years later, during the time of Emperor Hector I, that Heimdall was once again retaken. Hearing tales of a fabled knight with great power, the chief of the gnomes bade the new Hexen clan elder, Roselia, to guide Hector to a weapon that could assist him in retaking the capital from the Dark Dragon, a seven arge tall crimson humanoid frame, and the wielder of a thousand weapons. Upon passing the trial and creating a spiritual bond with the being, Hector became the Awakener of Vermilion, the pilot of Testarossa. With its strength, he and his army were able to wrest control of the city back from the dead, and the Vermilion Knight was able to best the Dark Dragon. In a cruel twist of fate though, the dragon's miasma-filled blood seeped onto the Divine Knight, causing it to become corrupted and Emperor Hector to lose his life. 
Once Heimdall was retaken, the gnomes and Hexen clan once again worked together, this time to seal the corrupted Divine Knights below the ruins that would soon after become Valflame Palace. And though they were successful, it's around this moment that the Chief of the Gnomes breaks all contact with the world, warning the new Emperor and Roselia of the prophecy of the end. From this day forth, the Hexen clan would guide Awakeners to Divine Knights during times of conflict, and the resultant battles would be wiped from the minds of the populace, a cycle doomed to repeat as if guided by fate. What followed was a period of tumult in Erebonia's history as powerful families sought supremacy of the land, and every time the powers of the Divine Knights would be called upon to gain an advantage. Some families were even able to monopolise power of these beings, creating trial grounds for future Awakeners within their employ. And though some families without a Divine Knight's aid turned to the mages to create magic golems to combat them, it could only act as a deterrent for so long. At the end of this period, the result was the formation of a recognised group known as the Four Great Houses, the pinnacle of nobility, who would hence hold authority over four provinces within Erebonia. These periods of conflict would continue, staining the history of Erebonia with blood, until they reached a fevered pitch in 947 of the Septian calendar, providing the grandest stage yet for the knights. With the death of Emperor Valius V and the assassination of the Crown Prince, the fourth Prince Orthros usurped the throne by force, culling any who opposed his authority. This led to a chain of events that would see other would-be successors rise, setting off one of the bloodiest civil wars in Zemurian history, the War of the Lions. Over the course of the five years, as was the case in any conflict, divine knights were once again called upon to do battle. The Palatinate Knight Zector was awoken by a mercenary in the charge of Prince Lucius, while the Ashen Knight Valimar and Argent Knight Argreon were taken by the eventual victor of the War Drykles and Leanne Sandlet, the Lance Maiden, who were both guided by the Hexen Clan Elder. Orthros, however, did the unforgivable, reawakening the sealed Vermilion Apocalypse and its dreaded Infernal Castle, which siphoned the very life force from the citizens of Heimdall. With its power, he was able to fell the Palatinate Knight and kill the Argent Awakener before being defeated by Drykles and Valimar. The brutal war came to an end in 952 of the Septian calendar, with the crowning of Emperor Drykles, who would later become known as the Father of the Reconnaissance. However, the true nature of this battle, or rather, the role of the Divine Knights, was starting to take shape. It was clear, no more so than in the War of the Lions, that the Divine Knights were fated to fight, again, and again, and again, as if drawn together by some irresistible force. And there was one more thing to fathom. The Great One was originally split into seven fragments, but only six knights had appeared at least once throughout the history of Erebonia. So where was the final fragment? In the shadows of history, the last fragment of the Seven plotted. This being became the receptacle of the largest portion of the Great One's power, like the other Divine Knights, its creators provided this being with the ability to act autonomously, but whereas the other six developed into chivalric beings, this Knight of Black was influenced by the bad faith and strife of humans, believing that humanity would only evolve through endless conflict. It was with this warped mindset that the Ebon Knight, Ishmelga, laid down a grand plan to attain godhood, to once again become the Great One. Acting behind the scenes to give itself the best chance of victory, the Ebon Knight planted a curse within the very land of Erebonia itself, something that would spur violent emotions within the citizens who fell within its borders, and something that was even more potent in those who harboured insecurity, as if brainwashing the people to become puppets of war. It could even steer fate for certain unfortunate individuals who fell within its throes, setting the seed for prophesied assassinations or allowing rivals to fight for three days and nights without rest. This curse, along with the Great Twilight, would provide the ideal kindling for an ancient ritual that would see the Seven once again become one. But despite being the harbinger of countless calamities throughout Erebonia's past, including the attack of the Dark Dragon, and the being who was the cause for the Gnomes' parting ways after the retaking of the capital in the wake of its defeat, the Ebon Knight lacked one thing to ensure its victory. Or rather, it's more fitting to say it lacked someone. It needed an Awakener a pilot who was worthy of its immense power, and during the War of the Lions, it found a suitable candidate. Relinquish it to me. 
It belongs to me. Your soul. Your entire being. Following the inauguration of Emperor Dreykel's, Ishmelga came to the man in its thought form, eating away at his consciousness and consistently beckoning him to become its awakener. Dreykel's, however, was not easily swayed, and though he took the burden in secret to his grave, he never gave in to a being that he saw as repulsive compared to the Ashen Knight Valimar. Ishmelga did not give up even after Dreykel's death though, and over 200 years later in 1192 of the Septian calendar, it chanced upon the reincarnation of the late Emperor, a man of the military with a will of iron, Giliaf Osborne. Orchestrating a tragedy that would later be wiped from the annals of history itself, it preyed on the minds of minor noble generals in the Imperial Army, who later could not believe what they had done when they were finally made to answer for their crimes. They simply described it as a moment of weakness. This was no consolation to Osborne though, as he paid the ultimate price in attempting to stop them. Or rather, his family were the ones who paid the price. With his wife murdered and his son dying from debris that pierced his heart, Ishmelga had laid the situation perfectly for the reincarnated Dreykels to take the role. Hadios, please, someone answer me. God is a fiend, I don't care. I'll do anything. Take me instead if you must. Just please, spare our son's life. Oh, how long I've waited to hear those words. In exchange for saving the child's life by transplanting the heart of the father to the son, Osborne would become the Ebon Awakener. With the perfect pilot and servant under its influence in Osborne and Black Alberic, the Ebon Knight could now see to its final preparations. In the year 1204 of the Septian Calendar, war once again ravages Erebonia, and the Divine Knights take up their roles for the final time. With the noble uprising eventually quelled by Osborne and the pseudo-clash of Azure and Ashen failing, he looks to assemble the remaining fragments at the behest of Ishmelga, and by 1206 of the Septian calendar, he finally gets his wish. At the Graal of Erebos, the nameless holy beast is slain by Osborne's estranged son, Reen Schwarzer, the Ashen Chevalier, resulting in the great twilight enveloping the land of Erebonia, setting the stage for what is to come. As events continue to unfold, a grand military operation is put into motion in response to the framed assassination of Emperor Eugent, which would end with the invasion of the Calvert Republic. Known as Operation Jormungand, it would be the front of the war to end all wars, and the kindling that would serve as sustenance for the ancient ritual, for only when the world is near its end in the throes of battle can the Great One once again become whole. This in itself is the destiny of the Divine Knights and their Awakeners, to be driven by fate itself to fight each other, and upon the charred and broken remains of the defeated competitors will a single victor appear. This ritual was known as the Rivalry of the Seven, and at long last all the players were assembled on the board. The so-called dress rehearsals such as those occurring during the War of the Lions had served their purpose. Seven Knights and Seven Awakeners, of which four had become immortals, beings who were compulsorily kept alive by the curse to serve their purpose in the rivalries. It's only upon their defeat that they would pass into the arms of Adios and the defeated knight's essence assimilated into the victor. As the war draws closer, rivalries start to occur in spirit shrines dotted around the Empire, and in preparation for the final bout, the gnomes bring forth their greatest creation near the Great Twilight Climax, Tuaf de Danan, a fortress used during the war with the Kin of Fire and modified to act as the spot of the final rivalry, the moment where Ishmelga would assuredly claim victory against a worthy opponent who had claimed the powers of the remaining five. That climactic battle comes about on the first day of the war, and though the malice and strife fueling the final rivalry was not deemed sufficient by Black Alberic, Osborne, and especially Ishmelga, were all too eager to get started against their opponents, Valimar the Ashen Knight piloted by Reen Schwarzer and Ordeen the Azure Knight piloted by Crow Armbrust, who had been taken as a retainer after his defeat in the first rivalry. With the ultimate stage set, all that remained was the battle to decide the fate of the world.
Come the end of the duel, Valimar and Reen prevail, and the Ebon Knight is absorbed as per the rules of the ritual, corrupting Ashen and Awakener alike, displaying the true malice that Osborne and Drykles had endured for years. And for a while, it appears that the cursed being is about to attain what it has desired for over a millennia. Surely, only a miracle could stop it now. And a miracle it was that would thwart it. Ishmelga had been tricked, its Awakener Osborne had managed to resist the darkness that surrounded him for years, and orchestrated the only chance that the heroes of Erebonia had to rid the land of its curse once and for all, by drawing Ishmelga's fort form to the realm of humanity at the climax of the rivalries. With the bonds created through years of hardship and achievement, the curse that enveloped Reen's hearts given to him by Osborne is ripped away, and sealed within an earthen prison bestowed as a last act by Argreus, the Holy Beast of Earth. However, now that the powers of the Seven Divine Knights had converged into one, and Ishmelga's essence had finally found its vessel, the united powers begin to coalesce into the Great One. It's only now though that Ishmelga realises the level of treachery his Awakener had planned. Since the final rivalry had started too early, the components had become tainted in a sense, and what arose was an incomplete Great One, far below that in strength of the original, but nonetheless powerful. That being said, it gave the chance for the heroes of Zumuria to slay the monstrosity once and for all. With its vessel destroyed, Ishmelga flees in terror to the higher plane to escape, but is swiftly followed by Reen. Its persuasion falls on deaf ears, and the curse that plagued Erebonia for so long is destroyed with a gleam of cold steel. With the rivalries complete, the six remaining Divine Knights once again appear, and with their purpose as vessels for the Septarian of Steel complete, they begin to fade away, but not before providing one last miracle, such is the noble nature of legendary knights. With the activation of the Sacrament program inbuilt to the Septarians of Fire and Earth, and the orders given by the Chief of the Gnomes now no longer under Ishmelga's influence, along with the head of the Hexen Clan, the Divine Knights convert their residual energies into a new vessel to hold Crow Armbrust's soul, and also secure the soul of the Originator Zero, allowing Class Seven to once again become whole. With the miracle performed, the Lost Zem and Arc Rouge forever disappear from the world, and the Divine Knights follow them to the Great Beyond.